Welcome to today's edition of Daytime Dialogues. It's a true pleasure to welcome an old friend, Rabbi Dr. Edward Reichman, who occupies now the, the Rabbi Isaac and Bella Tendler Chair in Medical Ethics at Yeshiva College, is also a professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine and the Department of Epidemiology and Population Health at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and is also a prolific writer, having just published two books in the last six months, uh, both of them, by the way, available on Amazon. Uh, and both of them hopefully will have a moment or so to talk about. But even more than that, for those of us from Chicago, Rabbi Reichman went to the yeshiva before he went off to YU. And I had the uh, pleasure of being in Sheer with his older brother, but even more of having spent time in Lithuania and other trips with his late father, Rabbi Bernard Reichman from Wisconsin, where Rabbi, where Rabbi Dr. Reichman hails. So it's a great pleasure to have you, doctor. And thank you very much for giving me your time today. My absolute pleasure, Rabbi Tanki. Really, really is supposed to join you today. Oh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun because some of the things you print are so fascinating. Uh, there was just an article that you just put out on the Sfarim blog as well that I was reading and all different kinds of things that have been published. Let me start from a simple one from the paperback that you just came out with regarding the pandemic, but not so much the pandemic. It was titled Pondering Pre-Modern or Moderna Pandemics in Jewish History. Um, I, I'm curious. This pandemic and the response of our Jewish community, was the response that much different than what we've had in previous times in Jewish history? Uh, so uh, the, the response that we had uh, varied a little bit. In concept, it was the same. Uh, some dimensions that uh, share commonality, at least in the majority, there was uh, deference and respect uh, for the, the mainstream medical community and for the uh, dictates of the medical community in terms of how to respond from a medical perspective and, and incorporate those medical perspectives into halacha. Now, you and I know that there was clearly a, a, a significant minority dissent uh, to that acceptance of the, of the mainstream uh, medical perspective, but, but Gedolim, like uh, Yisrael Salanter, when he supposedly made Kiddush during a uh, uh, young Kipper in the uh, in the midst of a cholera pandemic uh, back in the 1800s, and Rabbi Kiva Eger uh, and the Hassan Sofer and others, Rabbi Kiva Eger in particular, uh, dealt extensively with cholera pandemics. He's he's famous for uh, uh, for some of his letters, which include suggestions about how to uh, how to uh, arrange davening during a cholera pandemic, uh, where he's the one who's oft quoted. Many of you may be familiar with this. Uh, where he said, during the weekdays, we should have uh, 15 people coming to shul at one particular time, no more than that, for uh, for Shachris and the Mincha Marv. Uh, you should sign up for your rotation, and you should keep rotating from, you know, Elosa Shachar for Shachris, every every uh, every minion, just 15 people. He even recommended there should be a guard from the secular authorities, a police officer, to prevent people who didn't sign up for the minion to enter the minion. Um, so th there was a tremendous respect for uh, for what was then the uh, the the consensus medical opinion. Uh, in that perspective, uh, we we continued that uh, that tradition, uh, and even the dissent. By the way, there is tradition for that dissent also, uh, but the dissent has has generally been a uh, been a minority dissent. And did we find that sense of initial um, people coming together as we saw, and then people beginning to split apart? also in uh, the pre-modern times? So, so that divisiveness, uh, I think, is unique to the political landscape of the 21st century. That, I, I don't think, really existed uh, uh, in the past, uh, you know, especially in terms of the vaccination issue with, uh, with pro-vaccine and anti-vaccine camps sort of uh, opposing each other and, uh, and separating from each other. That, that was, uh, was something which, which I don't believe we have seen uh, We've seen in the past, and definitely not not to that extent. So that that was a unfortunately negative aspect of the current pandemic. But the the other issues, I think, there's a lot of uh, a lot of commonality. And to move on to just another subject in, in the whole realm of medical ethics, which you are an expert on, you teach courses on it now, especially in your new appointment as the chair, the Tendler Chair. In that realm of medical ethics, what are what are the key things that that doctors and ethicists are struggling with today? 
So uh, there are many new and exciting frontiers. Uh, we still struggle with the end of life issues, with uh, uh, with how long to keep people alive, whether to put people on respirators, not put them on respirators, put feeding tubes, not put feeding tubes. Those are our uh, day-to-day -day issues, which which many people struggle with. Uh, there are some new frontier issues which don't necessarily affect the uh, the individual per se, but uh, society at large is is developing in the, for sure in the area of genetics, for example. Uh, there are many exciting advances and developments in the uh, in the world of genetics. One of the issues which has come to the fore uh, in the recent past with the Supreme Court's reconsidering uh, Roe versus Wade uh, is a revisiting of the halachic perspective on abortion. Uh, so abortion is an age-old issue. It's it's one of the medical halachic issues, which is thousands of years old, uh, as opposed to discussions about surrogate motherhood or infertility or organ transplants, and uh, which are all a product of the modern era. Uh, and uh, and the halachic approach is 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 not unanimous in terms of uh, whether abortion is permitted, when it's permitted, when it's not permitted, uh, and that complex landscape within the Jewish community. Uh, is now uh, is surfacing in terms of how we should uh, support or not support the reversal of, of, uh, of Roe versus Wade. And in fact, neither Roe versus Wade nor the reversal of Roe versus Wade is exactly in consonance with, with a halachic perspective. Uh, so that, uh, that poses a bit of a challenge as well. So when you deal with the medical ethical issues of abortion, for example, how does it play out in the actual decision making with uh, in in cases that come to the hospital or come to physicians so so i am i am emergency medicine so uh, so i may be involved in cases for example of of morning after uh, i'm not involved of, of the use of the morning after pill or request of the morning after pill or postcoital con contraception um, so those cases i would be involved in i'm not uh, directly clinically involved in the abortion cases uh, elective abortions uh, that would really be in the uh, in the domain of the uh, of the gynecologist, um, but uh, but but there's no question that uh, that everybody is concerned. And, and one of the things that we're concerned about is that if Roe v. Wade is is reversed, and uh, there are some states you know down south that uh, that that make abortion illegal even for uh, cases where the mother's life is threatened. Uh, in very extreme cases, it, it could very well be that uh, that a postsake could paskin that it's halachically permissible to perform an abortion, yet uh, that uh, that Orthodox Jew would not be able to obtain that abortion in the state that they live in. So that's uh, that's a definite concern. You know, a few weeks ago, I had a conversation on this program with Rabbi Hauer right after the OU had issued its nuanced uh, statement regarding Roe v. Wade which basically said it's not a good situation as is, and it's not a good situation what's being presented. There's somewhere in the middle that we live. And uh, not everyone likes nuance in our day. And especially right. when, when, when you walk into the hospital and you want a specific answer itself. In, in terms of the genetic, the genetic issues, what are the major ethical issues regarding genetics today? One one really fascinating uh, development is the uh, is the widespread uh, use now of what's called ancestry DNA testing, uh, which uh, which some of your listeners may be familiar with, uh, where you can send away a cheek swab and uh, and you'll uh, you'll get returned a, uh, a a sheet which tells you you know what percentage uh, of your heritage is from Africa, from Germany, from Ireland. Uh, in in that readout, you'll also have a percentage which is uh, um, which is uh, Ashkenazi Jewish, um, and uh, and people are finding things that uh, in some cases where they're not particularly uh, expecting to find uh, in terms of relationships that they may have, because in addition to telling you your supposed ancestry, which is a little less of an exact science, it can also tell you relationships that you have. Uh, and in some cases, I mean, in the general world, for example, I'm not talking specifically in the Jewish community, People find out that they're the product uh, that their their belief their supposed father, the, the father who raised them their entire lives, is not their genetic father, uh, and it, it raises some uh, some complex issues in terms of uh, you know, potential in the Jewish community if it would happen within the Jewish community whether there's an issue of mamzerus or not mamzerus. But, but let me divert for a second to another very fascinating aspect of genetics, 
uh, which has very interesting halakh ramifications, and that's the use of what's called mitochondrial DNA testing. Uh, mitochondrial DNA testing is the identification of genes which are transmitted maternally exclusively. They're transmitted from mother to child. Um, and, uh, and, and as a result, you could have the following very interesting scenario, which hasn't yet transpired, but will transpire in the next 50, 60 years. Uh, you have a, a person who goes to college in a, a Midwest campus, comes back with a girl whose name is Kathy for, uh, for dinner one day to his family and says, you know, mom and dad, Abba, Ima, I, have, I have good news, I have bad news. Um, I found this girl, she's, she's amazing, and I think she's the right one for me. Uh, but unfortunately, she's Catholic. But the good news is that she did a, a, a cheek swab. She sent it off to one of the uh, DNA testing companies. And it said that she has the exact same mitochondrial DNA as a woman who lived a, a generation or two ago, who was an Orthodox Jewish woman, who was a Rebetzin. So, uh, so the truth is, you know, again, this case hasn't transpired yet. But if that case actually does happen, uh, this woman is genetically Jewish. She's a Bas Sachar Bas of someone who's known to be a Jew. Uh, and even though somewhere along the line they got disconnected, she might actually be able to switch out her cross for a mug and dove it and walk into Shul the next day and, uh, and be 100% Jewish. Now, we don't have that right now. What we do have is the following and, and the utilization of this notion of mitochondrial DNA transmission. There are scientists who've taken t uh, tens of thousands of, of Jews and identified their DNA and found certain mutations in the mitochondrial DNA that, that Ashkenazi Jews share. Um, and the hope and belief is that these, these common mutations are also sort of collectively a proof to some extent that you are, you are a descendant of, of the Jewish community maternally. So how is that relevant halakhically? So if you have a Jew from Russia, for example, who has no history of lineage and, what, and comes to the Beis Din and Eretz Yisrael and wants to get married, uh, unfortunately, the, all the records have been destroyed. There's no basic for us for them to look uh, about family. So could you perform this mitochondrial DNA test on this individual and, uh, and, and say that maybe if, if he's positive for these mitochondrial mutations, that, that maybe this or in conjunction with other, other evidence might render this individual Jewish with respect to uh, halacha? Well, I haven't, there have been posts, Kim, who've already said that that can be used as a tzad. To, to support if we, we have some other levels. But I don't know if anyone, have there been any post who's who've yet ruled that DNA alone can be used as a, as a halal so, determinant? So I'm not sure if, if that's the sole evidence. I'm not sure if post there may be, I, I don't know specifically, but I'm not sure if they've ruled specifically if that's the sole evidence without any uh, corroboration, if you could rely exclusively on that. And the data is going to keep getting stronger and stronger with the passage of time. So uh, the test, the halachic requirements will need to be revisited as the, the mitochondrial DNA testing gets more sophisticated. And as an ethicist, where does, where does your role jump in? I understand how a post would come in, and I understand how the physician comes in. Is there an ethical dilemma in this? So, uh, you know, the, the role of the ethicist really, you know, especially the, uh, the Jewish ethicist is really the, the intermediary uh, between the, uh, the Jewish patient and the Rav uh, in identifying what the issues are, and especially if there is conflict between secular approach to certain issues uh, versus halachic approach to, to other issues. So, for example, in, in, the, uh, in the world that we live in, the climate is to be uh, is to be relatively non-aggressive in end-of-life issues uh, and withholding care, making a patient to do not resuscitate, not putting a patient on a respirator, not putting a patient on a feeding tube. Those are things which which our secular society is is very comfortable with, and, and that's uh, in many cases the default position. Um, the objective of, of someone who uh, like myself who, who could be sort of a, an intermediary between the patient and the current secular ethical world that we live in and the post scheme uh, is to sort of navigate those waters where there's, uh, where there's inconsistency between the two. Even removing respirators is, uh, is something very common I've encountered, in, in the secular world. So I've encountered in hospitals where it goes to the ethics committee sometimes and they say that they need to um, remove the, uh, the breathing tube 
because it's been too long. And if they, the only option is a tracheostomy or things like that. And sometimes fighting the ethics committee uh, is a very complicated piece. Are you, in the hospitals where you work, are you part of those committees? Are you the interface of that committee? Are you the fighter? Uh, so I, I have been in the past. I'm, I'm not currently as active on the on the ethics committee, but I'm often consulted in in cases of Orthodox uh, families that that have conflict uh, to to enlighten the ethicists about the halachic perspectives. Uh, and there there are some legal aspects uh, also. So so one issue, for example, is the very definition of death. So uh, you know, as you well know, and I suspect uh, most of your listeners know, there is a major debate in uh, in contemporary halacha about uh, whether brain death, which is a relatively new definition in the in the world of medicine and science, really started back in the uh, late 1960s, early 1970s, took took a number of decades to uh, to accept in the Western world, whether that definition is accepted from a halachic perspective or not. Uh, so if someone is diagnosed with this unique uh, diagnosis of, of brain death, are they halachically dead or not? And what are the halachic ramifications? Um, can you remove the respirator? Uh, can, the person, uh, can the person's wife remarry? If a Kohen walks into a room, is he batame? Uh, and also of, of equal or greater importance, perhaps, is whether that person can serve as an organ donor or not, if they're, if they're halachically uh, considered as dead. So there, is, there are major post scheme who accept that brain death definition as halakhic death, and there are major post scheme who do not accept that brain death definition. Question is, if, if you have someone from a family who is in a state uh, that doesn't accept any exceptions to the brain death criteria, and they have a family member who sustains brain death, and uh, and the hospital says it is within our legal right to remove the respirator because because our state holds brain death to be halachic death, uh, and the from family says you know according to our posik uh, our family member is still halachically alive, uh, that presents a major conflict. So many Jews live in the New York area, New Jersey area. So those are two states that have religious exemptions uh, that allow families to, uh, to to not to disconnect the respirator in cases of uh, of brain death. Uh, but people who live in other states, you know, have to have to fight that through the ethics committees, through the uh, uh, through the legal channels as well. Have you found yourself involved in those kind of cases? I've been consulted in those cases. Yes, yes. And there's been there have been there have been a number of those uh, of those cases. That, fortunately, not that common. Um, uh, but there there was an interesting case in California a number of years ago. Um, Jahi McMath it was a, a young young uh, girl in, the, in her teenage years who tragically uh, sustained uh, brain death uh, criteria, uh, and it was uh, and she and she actually survived on a respirator with a diagnosis of brain death for a prolonged period of time for uh, for over a year maybe maybe a few years if I recall correctly. It was not a simple matter. It was a challenge to the physiological understanding of brain death in the in the medical community as well. Um, and there was a from doctor who was asked to convert her endotracheal tube, which is a, a temporary form of maintaining her on a breathing machine, to a, a tracheostomy uh, to be able to transport her from the state of California because the state of California s refused to allow her to remain on a respirator. Uh, and they wanted to disconnect the respirator and the family wanted to transport her to New Jersey. where There was a Catholic hospital. This wasn't the Jewish family, by the way. Uh, where there was a Catholic hospital that would uh, that would take her and care for her, uh, even though she had uh, technically a diagnosis of brain death because the, because religious exemption applied in the state of New Jersey. So a surgeon involved was a Jewish a surgeon, and, and he asked me, is it halachically permissible for him to perform this tracheostomy if the patient's halachically dead? Uh, might it be a case of uh, of needle and mace? Now I'm not a posik, but I uh, but I helped uh, navigate him. Uh, you know, through the post scheme to address this, uh, to address this complex issue. In the end, he he wasn't uh, he wasn't uh, involved in the case, but it was a it was a fascinating question. So, what was the decision on that? So he 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 ended up begging off on the case, but but the truth is, uh, the decision was he could have done the tracheostomy because clearly there are some post scheme who maintain that this person is unlawfully alive. Uh, and uh, and as such, it, it would have been Yeshal Milisnoch. It would have been okay for him to perform it to uh, to sustain that patient to be transferred to, uh, for further care. No, so I re I remember when the controversy was very hot in the uh, very early 80s, 
bringing Rabbi Tendler and Rabbi Bleich, who took very different positions to the yeshiva, uh, picking them up separately at O'Hare <laughs> Airport and bringing them in and then listening to their positions in the car and why the other was wrong. Rabbi Tendler, of course, always quoted the Shver, Rabbi Moshe, that brain death was acceptable. And in fact, I consulted with him on a number of occasions and he held that position for, uh, throughout his life once Rabbi Moshe had passed according to his understanding of Rabbi Moshe. So it was, uh, it was a very, it is an, a, and was a very heated issue. I think it has it quieted down a bit in terms of the, the, the name calling, I guess. <laughs> I, uh, I, by the way, I also vividly remember those debates. That, that was our form of edutainment, if you will. You know, watching those, uh, it, was, it was like watching a boxing match. It was really an intellectual boxing match. It was very thrilling. And I saw many of those, both on the East Coast and uh, in other places and at conferences over the years. Uh, ha has it quieted down? I mean, medically, not much has significantly changed. There, there still are some, you know, discussions about the physiology of brain death, but but the mainstream community and the neurological societies have all reconfirmed the brain death criteria uh, from decades ago. And, uh, and in the halachic world, it remains a debate. I think, I think uh, over, the, over the decades, I think more posthum have, uh, have begun to, to uh, accept brain death criteria as halachic uh, criteria. Um, I, it's not a numbers game. There are, there are Gedolia Postkin who, uh, who are not in favor of brain death criteria, absolutely. And there are Gedolia Postkin who are in favor of the brain death criteria. Um, and, and that landscape hasn't really changed radically. Uh, but there hasn't really been much uh, in, in terms of uh, new, which is which has led to uh, to revisiting it. And of course, the the issue of organ donation is is contingent upon the psak of whether you hold uh, brain death as halachic death there's or even not. A, there's even a shift in the holds. The halachic organ donation society just appointed a new executive director. Connections to Chicago, Rabbi Shlomo Brody, his wife yes, yes. is Chicago, uh, born and uh, from the Shapiro family. And uh, he, he and I, we, we had a conversation and he told me that he's trying to shift some of the focus to end of life or living wills so that people are more prepared, whether they are prepared to be organ donors or not, at least they're making those decisions from a halakhic perspective. Uh, uh, yes, Rabbi, Rabbi Brody, I've also uh, had the fortune of, of having conversations with Rabbi Brody and I think... Uh, uh, I think that objective of including organ donation still remains an important part of the discussion, but it, it's clearly not as, as uh, relevant to the majority of the Jewish population. It, it applies to Baruch Hashem to a, to a relative minority, but expanding uh, you know, the mandate to include end of life issues and halachic approach to end of life decision making, I think, I think will make a huge difference and be a, a tremendous service for, uh, for Kali Yisrael. Uh, shifting focus for a moment to your other passion, I think, regarding the history of medicine. Um, one of your articles talked about a Jewish graduate of the medical school in Padua, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and even your other book, which came out, dealt with the, 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 the history of the anatomy of Jewish law and the shifts. How do you do research on, on medical degrees from the university in Padua from hundreds of years ago? Uh, yes, this is indeed a, a, a major uh, passion project of mine is, uh, is the interest in, in Jewish medical history in general uh, and, uh, and the training of Jewish medical students throughout the centuries. And I think it gives people a fascinating historical perspective. You think, you know, Jews really started going to medical school maybe in the late uh, 19th, uh, 19th century, early 20th century, et cetera. But, but Jews have been training in medicine for many hundreds of years. And uh, the reason why I, why, uh, I focus uh, on the University of Padua because it's the first university to officially allow Jewish medical students to attend. So before that, the, the, all the universities were affiliated with the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church uh, explicitly said that Jews were not allowed to attend the universities. And if you wanted to attend a university, you had to avow your belief in Christianity. Uh, there were some exceptions over the years where literally you had to get permission from the Pope himself to be able to attend universities. But the University of Padua, somewhere around the 16th century, 
uh, officially opened its doors to Jewish students and non-Catholic students, including Protestants as well. Uh, and many, many Jews over the next 200 years attended that uh, university. So, so I have been on a mission to identify archival evidence of the training of those Jewish students. And the, the two archival categories that I have that I have found, one is the diplomas of the Jewish medical students. Um, and as opposed to the diploma, which actually is uh, on my in my office, which is a pretty uh, simple lackluster diploma uh, from from medical school, the diplomas from Renaissance Italy, where this university was, uh, are spectacular illustrated diplomas, um, uh, uh, spectacular artwork. Uh, in auction today, they would go for you know thirty, forty thousand uh, dollars. So it's unique. Wasn't the language different between the Jewish students and the non-Jewish students? Yes, 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 absolutely. So what was fascinating is, is uh, if you pick up a Jewish diploma, you'll notice, uh, if you look at the text of the diploma, that there's some accommodations for the Jewish students. So, for example, the, the invocation on the diploma of the, of the Catholic students said in big letters in Christe nomine, in the name of Yoshka, um, so, you know, you can't have that for a Jewish student. I mean, a, you know, a Jewish mother sending your kid to medical school, coming back with a diploma that says in Christe nomine isn't, isn't going to work. Uh, so they actually altered it to in Dei Eterne nomine, in the name of the eternal God. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many other uh, amendations also. The name of the year used to allude to, uh, to Christianity, so they, they changed the name of the year. The illustrations used to be Catholic illustrations. For the Jewish student, you'll find no Catholic illustrations. You'll find uh, a flora and fauna and things like that, but no, uh, no Catholic illustrations. I, I was at the university in Padua. We can still see Galileo's desk, lectern. No, it is uh, the, uh, Stender, right? Yeah, Galileo the Stender is still there. But with, <laughs> uh, do they have those records still at the university? If they kept, if they kept the Stender, do they keep the records? So the records that they do have is they have a written record in their archives of the of the graduation of the students. And what's fascinating is uh, all the Jewish students, and this wasn't unique to the University of Padua, say Hebraeus or Ibreo associated with their name. So it's very easy to identify who the Jewish students were at the University of Padua. What they don't have is they don't have the actual diplomas because those were handed to the students. So those have been passed down in families or ended up in, in collections or private collections. Uh, and thus far, I've identified a total of 19 diplomas of Jewish medical students from the University of Padua. Uh, some of which are absolutely uh, spectacular. And just the other archival item, which is really unique to, to, uh, to Padua in, the, in that time period, is that in Renaissance Italy, they used, to, um, they used to write poetry for virtually everything. They'd write poetry for Brisson, for, uh, for births, for, uh, uh, for Asium, for, uh, for Leviathan, uh, you know, for, for marriage, for, for all these things. There was one category that was unique in, in poetry, and they wrote poetry for the Jewish medical graduates of the University of Padua. Uh, and, and I have spent years tracking down the samples, examples of this, and, and thus far I've identified uh, a record of 100 poems written for Jewish medical graduates of the University of Padua. Not all of them are extant, but, but 70 or 80 of them are extant, and they're found in libraries and private collections uh, over the world. And uh, it's a real t you know, testimony and, uh, and fascinating concrete, tangible archival record of uh, the Jewish medical training of that time. What got you started on that in the history? You know, that, that's a great question. I, I actually went to Padua as a medical student, um, and I, I started studying medical history in my, my third year, fourth year of medical school. I did an elective. At the, at, uh, it's called the Wellcome Institute in London, and I first discovered the whole notion of Jewish medical history. Uh, and then, uh, and then one thing led to another. And once I found out about this University of Padua, that they were actually Jew from Jewish students training, you know, in the 1600s and the 1700s, I thought it was absolutely fascinating. And it started a, a lifelong journey, journey of, of interest in that uh, historical period. Did you ever obtain any of those diplomas yourself? Do you ever? Yeah. So I, I don't have any uh, any actual diplomas. I do have for for another discussion. I have some some actual dissertations of Jewish medical students. Uh, so the University of Padua did not have actual printed dissertations, but but when Jews started going to the Netherlands, 
um, and then to uh, in the late 1600s, and then to Germany in the in the 1700s. Uh, the Jewish medical students would uh, train, and they would uh, they would be required to write a dissertation, which was published. And I have some uh, I have I actually own two dissertations from those Jewish medical students. And one thing I've been looking for, uh, also, which uh, has been a search for many years, is Jewish uh, medical student dissertations that deal with Jewish topics. So these are Jewish from students graduating medical school in the 1700s and 1800s, and that the topic of their dissertations is about something Jewish. So, for, for example, there's a person named Ginsberger um, who uh, who wrote a dissertation in 17, roughly 1740s, 1750s, and his dissertation he was the first Jewish student of a, of, a, of a university in Germany, and he wrote on medicine in the Talmud. And, that, and I have, I don't have the original dissertation, but I have a copy of that, uh, of his dissertation. Uh, and people, and people wrote about, you know, many Jewish things. There aren't, there aren't that many of those. I found maybe 15 to 20 in all the dissertations over the years, but it's, it's a fascinating little subset uh, of a window of the minds of from students. Well, I, fascinating on both sides of this conversation, the medical ethics and the medical history. The big problem I have right now, doctor, is our time is up. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so I want to thank you again for uh, for giving me of your time and also for all of the things you've done. Uh, I uh, remember you before you were Rabbi Doctor, and I am very proud of the fact that I can know you as Rabbi Doctor and all that you've accomplished and achieved and helped in our world today. So thank you so much for your time and my best regards to the family. Thank you so much for the spouse of joining you. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye.